September 11th, 2011, I started Portland Community Church. I was excited about starting a church from the ground up. We would have a great mission statement, leading people into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. We would have, uh, you know, good uh, core values. Uh, we'd have a good philosophy. We'd have strong youth ministry and children's ministry and worship and uh, music ministry. We'd have vibrant uh, community groups. Um, it'd be the perfect church. And then I realized we can't have a perfect church because I'm in it. <laughs> Never going to work. Uh, now, eight years into the venture, I think we have a great church. Jory says to me many times, you know, I love this church. People are so kind and friendly and so many people have friendships with each other. It just sort of feels good. But I don't think we're making as big an impact on Portland as I would like. I doubt we've seen as many people come to Christ as God would hope. We don't have systems in place for everything to be as effective as we could be. So how do you get a healthy church? You can't believe how much better a healthy church performs. Now, substitute any word you want to make it relevant to you. You can't believe how much better a healthy organization performs. You can't believe how much better a healthy company performs. You can't believe how much better an, a, a healthy athletic team performs. You can't bl- believe how much better a healthy school performs. You can't believe how much better a healthy family performs. A healthy organization always does better. Imagine you're a crew master of a rowing team. You're in a big race. And all of a sudden you notice only three of your members are rowing. Five are asleep. And two are actually trying to swamp the boat. I mean, you can't have a good rowing team like that. Yet Gallup released a survey a while back, and they said only 30% of American workers are engaged in their jobs. They're really all in. 52% are unengaged. They're just collecting a paycheck. 18% are actually actively working against the company. You can't have a healthy business with those kind of stats. January 21st, 1976, two Concords, one each from British Airways and Air France, with fair-paying customers, took off simultaneously from Heathrow to Bahrain and from Paris to Rio de Janeiro. They soon scheduled flights from Paris to New York and London to New York. Uh, the planes were massively expensive. Uh, they cost billions of dollars. And as soon as they took off, I mean, they were so fast, you could go from Europe to New York in three hours instead of the typical seven hours. You would think it would be massively successful But almost from the beginning, people around the airports began to complain because of the huge noise of the four uh, turbojets. And so they had to schedule the flights only from to fly over the water. So they had to leave an airport that was on the water and could only land in an airport on the water. The planes only held 100 passengers due to the costs And the limitation in seats and flight paths, the Concorde was soon rendered cost prohibitive. Even though the airlines recognized that the Concorde was not viable, they still flew them for another 27 years. Why? They kept flying the planes because they had spent so much money 
on them. When a company used something even though it continues to use it even though it's not, no longer viable, economists call this a sum cost balance. To be a healthy church, we have to liberate ourselves from systems like the Concord that are not working. If we feel a tension as Sunday rolls around, because we have dozens of volunteer slots to fill to bring the ministry programs alive, deep down we think there must be a better way. Is there a better way? How do you get a healthy organization? How do you create a healthy church? In Ephesians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul suggests a better way. Turn in your Bible, if you have one, uh, Ephesians 4. If you want to use the Bibles under our seats, it's on page 1,175. For three chapters, Paul has been unfolding God's plan to bring all creation together under the lordship of Jesus Christ. He tells us God's plan is for the church, the body of Christ, to be disciples who make disciples, who make disciples, who take the fullness of Christ to every corner of the world. In Ephesians 4, he tells us you can't believe how much better a healthy church performs. I find in Paul's words in Ephesians 4, 1 to 16, three things that make a healthy church. One, in a healthy church, everyone helps in some way with the gifts God has given them. Paul writes in verse 1, read this with me. As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you've received. Paul tells us that each one of us, if we've given our lives to Christ, have a calling from God. This general calling that we all have, read this with me, is to be a disciple who makes disciples, who make disciples to take the fullness of Christ to every corner of the world. We're to come to Christ and get so filled up with his love that we take his fullness to every corner of the world. We also have a unique calling which is the intersection of our spiritual gifts, our passions, and our story. To remember that, think GPS, gifting, passions, story. Paul continues in verse 7, read this with me. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. Paul says that each one of us have been given by Christ at least one spiritual gift for use in the world, use in the body of Christ. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. What does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. Paul uh, uh, pictures a, a triumphant army general winning a battle, and then bringing home the, the plunder to his troops. Christ gives all of his followers spiritual gifts. These are gifts that we are to use in our work, our schools, our families, and in the church. Now, when something's not done in a church, the knee-jerk reaction is to say, hey, where's, where's the pastor's? Why aren't they doing this? One pastor broke his church of this tendency. He had been newly hired, and uh, he came to the board meeting, and he wanted authorization to hire a teenage member to mow the lawn. And one board member said, well, our former pastor used to do that. He says, I know. I've already asked him, but he doesn't want to do it anymore. <laughs> Sometimes I think the best thing that could happen to the church would be if all the pastors went away. Then everybody else would say, wait, we all got to chip in. We're going to make this thing work. We have to do our part. When all people are involved in some way, the church is healthier. 
Paul says in verse 16, read this with me, from him the whole body grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. As each part, that's you and me. The church grows as each part does its work. June 19, 2008, Esmond Green checked into the emergency room in King County Hospital in New York City. She sat there in the emergency room for 24 hours. Then she had a convulsion and she fell to the floor. Nobody moved. Anybody else in the emergency room? Uh, Nobody helped her. Security guards saw her but didn't do anything. He actually avoided looking any longer. She lay there for an hour, then she died. And then she laid there another hour before anybody did anything. Watch this. A sad death in New York City. Surveillance cameras at a city-run psychiatric hospital emergency room in Brooklyn capture a woman falling from a chair, writhing on the floor, and dying. There's the security Hospital guard. staff and other patients watch and do nothing for more than an hour. One guard doesn't even leave his chair, rolling it around the corner to stare at the body. In New York City. We call this uh, the bystander effect. In certain contexts, like an emergency room, you think, well, certainly a doctor's going to do something, or a nurse, or a security guard. I don't need to do anything. Or if we get overly dependent on the government, something happens, we think, well, somebody from the government will do something. Or in the church setting, we think certainly somebody in charge is going to do something. I don't need to do anything. In a healthy church, everyone says, this is my church. I'm going to do something to help. If I see something that's not right, I'm going to do something to fix it. I'm going to step forward, at least give my idea and lend a hand. Now, as soon as I talk about you stepping forward and doing something, I know some of you begin to get sweaty palms. Like, I don't know. When people describe their first ministry experience, they use phrases like, I was really nervous. I was so afraid. I felt so inadequate. I hope they didn't ask me any hard questions. Then they talk about the rush that came over them when they had their first experience. They realized God used them. God used something in their past to leverage somebody else's future. They talked about their faith with a friend, and the friend asked them all kinds of questions and said, hey, I'd like to go to church with you sometime. People really grow when they get into a ministry environment where they're stretched. Jesus was constantly stretching the disciples Uh, One of the uh, best examples is when uh, he was teaching about 10,000 people out in the country, and the disciples said to him, hey, you got to send these people away. they got to get something to eat in the towns around. And Jesus responded to them, why do we need to do that? You feed them. And they're going like, what? How are we going to feed all this many people? They said, we only have five loaves and two fish. And he says, bring them to me. It's like he's saying, well, bring me what you have. Bring me your lack of education, your inexperience, your fears, your insecurities, and watch what I can do through you. Why don't we all step up today and do what we can and let God work through us? Don't sit back and let others do things. Ask, how can I serve the Lord here? What can I do during the week, Monday through Saturday, to serve the world? To be a pastor to people in my life who don't know God. Two, in a healthy church, the leaders equip people to serve. Paul says in verse 11, read this with me. So Christ himself gave the apostles, 
the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. He doesn't say the apostles and pastors and teachers are supposed to do all the work. He says they're to equip the people to join them in doing the work. In a healthy church, a pastor does some of the work, but his main job or her main job is to equip other people to get involved in in, in the game too. Our bodies have 11 organ systems, including the circulatory, respiratory, digestive, nervous, immune, and reproductive system. If one of them goes down, you're sick. If two of them goes down, you go to the hospital. If three of them go down, you die. Paul tells us that God has given the church systems to make it healthy. A for apostles, P for prophets, E for evangelists, S for shepherds slash pastors. I I put shepherds in there to make this acrostic work. And T for teachers, A pest. Jesus was all, all of these. He was an apostle. He started the whole church off. He was a prophet. He said before he, beforehand that he was going to die and then he was going to be raised from the dead. And he did many miracles. He was an evangelist, told people about God and himself. He was a shepherd, pastor. He was very compassionate healed many people, and he was a teacher, phenomenal teacher. You need these five groups, Paul says, to equip the church. Apostles. Now, some people think that apostles were just the apostle Paul and the 11 disciples, and that once they died, that was the end of that. I believe that we still have apostles today, but we don't need to disagree about that. We can agree that we need these strengths in the church. Entrepreneurs, pioneers, expanders, starters, church planters. We need prophets. They're the challengers, correctors, diagnosers, moral compasses, pursuers of justice. Evangelists, they're the recruiters, attractors, inviters, sharers, proclaimers, persuaders. Shepherds, pastors, they're the nurturers, comforters, encouragers, empathizers, counselors, and then teachers. The explainers, instructors, illustrators, researchers. We need these five systems in the church, not to do everything, but to equip all of us to serve Christ in the church and in the world. We need these gifts to help us live out the Home Depot motto. You can do it. We can help. You can do it. You've got spiritual gifts. You have passions. You have your story. You can take the fullness of Christ to the people in your life who don't know God. And we can help you know how to do that. An Italian economist was the first to come up with the 2080 rule. He knows that 20% of the people owned 80% of the land. He found that 20% of his pea pods produced 80% of the yield. His observation led to a principle that is widely understood today. A minority of people are the most productive. Typically in a church, 20% of the people do 80% of the work. Traditionally, the church is focused on the 80%. But I'm wondering if we ought to have a paradigm shift. Maybe we should focus on the 20%. By definition, the 80% are not going to do much anyway. So why not focus on the 20%, help them learn how to make disciples who make disciples, and they can serve the 80%. Three, in a healthy church, people grow to maturity. Paul writes... Read this with me. Until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, 
Uh, the goal is to become mature. Paul describes three ways people grow to maturity. First, people grow to maturity in faith. Read verses 13 and 14 with me. Until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ, then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves, blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Uh, we become mature in our faith so we're not led astray by false teaching. The second way people grow to maturity is in love. This is a very famous verse of Paul. Read this with me, 15 and 16. Speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. We're to speak the truth in love. As we do this, the church will be built up and grow in love. We're supposed to speak the truth about Christ and the truth about people. But we don't just do it anyway. We do it in love. Before we have the right to communicate the truth to people, we have to love people. An American soldier in Afghanistan received a Dear John letter. He was devastated. To make his worse, his girlfriend wrote, please return my favorite picture of myself because I'd like to use that photograph for my engagement picture in the newspaper. Ouch. But his buddies in the barracks pulled together to support him. They, ga- they went around and they gathered pictures of girlfriends from all the guys and they filled a shoebox and sent it to this girl and he put this note with it. Please find your enclosed picture and return the rest. For the life of me, I can't remember which one you were. (laughs) Retaliation has its appeal. But Paul suggests a better way. Speak the truth in love. Many churches don't appear to show love Because there's confusion about this whole truth in love thing. You see it all the time on the news. Some church, some Christian organization makes a stand for truth, but it comes across as being very unloving to the watching world. For example, when we speak about what the Bible has to say about adultery, pornography, abuse of alcohol, tax fraud, lying, stealing, greed, or abortion. The danger is that we communicate that someone involved with one of these things is not loved by God and is not welcome in the church. It couldn't be further from the truth. The real issue is the one Christians have wrestled with since the beginning. Who is the church for? Who gets to participate? How good do you have to be? Which sins, if any, disqualify a person? Can the church welcome sinners? How about unrepentant sinners? How much baggage does a person have to leave at the door before they're allowed to participate? Can someone participate in the church if he or she is still working things out? We find the answer to these questions in the well-known hymn, Just As I Am. Read this with me. You know this song probably. Just as I am, though tossed about with many a conflict, many a doubt, fightings and fears within, without, O Lamb of God, I come, I come. Just as I am, poor, wretched, blind, sight, riches, healing of the mind, yea, all I need in thee to find, O Lamb of God, I come. Charlotte Elliott, the author, says, how do you come to Christ? Just as you are. 
The church is for everybody. We love everyone. We tell them God's truth, but we do so in love. Some people believe the church is for saved people who act like saved people. The catch is they're the ones that get to decide what act like saved person means. They get to determine which sins people can commit and which ones are evidence of not being saved. Oddly enough, the list changes every few years. For example, divorce used to be on the list, then mysteriously began disappearing in the 1970s. Greed is never included. Gossip's not on the list. Breaking the speed limit is not on the list. Most pastors I know have lead foots. So we don't put that one on the list. The problem in these churches is that you have to act like you have it all together to participate. The only way you can be in that church is to be a hypocrite. You have to be. These kind of churches are not very tolerant, not very accepting, and not very loving. And non-Christians stay away from them in droves. We want to be a church where everyone feels welcomed. Be a church where you feel free to invite your friends and family members, no matter what they believe. We want to be a church where everyone who comes here feels loved. The third way a healthy church will help people grow mature is in deploying more missionaries. The The paradigm shift is from more hierarchy to more missionaries. We move from a focus on the staff and church leadership to seeing all of us as missionaries sent into the world. Verse 16, Paul says, From him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. As each part does its work, the church grows. It reaches new people. It expands God's kingdom to people who don't know God. There are needs all around Portland. There are people in your life and mine who don't know God. You and I are called to be pastors to the people in our lives who are far from God. You have only between this day and your final day to make a play for God. Isn't it time for you to make your play? Middle schooler, high schooler, you're not waiting until you're an adult. God wants to use you now. You can't believe how much better a healthy church performs. In a healthy church, everyone helps out. In a healthy church, the leaders equip people to serve. And in a healthy church, people grow to maturity. When a basketball team breaks a huddle, you know this, Cody. Everybody puts their fist in the middle and say, let's go. It's like they're saying, we're all in this together. If you want to say today that you're all in, and you want to do everything you can to make this a healthy church, a healthy body that serves people all through the week, then I want you to make a fist right now. Would you just lift it up in the air? Thank you. Let's pray. Father, thank you for all these fists. People saying, count me in. I want to make a difference in this church. I want to make a difference in Portland. I want to be a pastor to people that don't know God in my life. Sign me up, God. If you want to say that, why don't you tell God that right now? I want to give you time to pray. Tell him you want to serve him, the people in your life that probably don't know Christ.
And you want to serve him here in the church to make this a healthy church. If you've never given your life to Christ, this would be a great time. Say, Christ, I want you in my life. Thank you for dying and being raised from the dead. Come into my life. Everybody pray right now. Father, thank you so much that your plan for the world is the church. You just don't do it all yourself. You equip us, people that have committed their lives to you, and you work through us to reach the world. Lord, we want to do that. We want to reach Portland. We want to reach our family members and friends and classmates, teammates, work partners. Use us this week. We dedicate ourselves to you. In Jesus' name.